So next up, we have our final talk today from the CFP, uh, Tim Wadua Brown from Cisco. It's kind of fitting that we're finishing up with uh, where telling a story has been a theme throughout the conference. So it's it's great that we're wrapping up with Tim, who's going to be telling a series of stories today. So please welcome to the stage, Tim. Okay. Your power. Probably useful, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking around for the last presentation. Um, let's just do a little bit of interaction because I want to keep everyone awake. Uh, so here, here, who here knows what the systems are that keep the lights on in their business, the systems that make you the money, the systems that mean that your, your customers, your your users um, can actually do the thing that they need from your organization. There's one man that's kind of saying, ish. Um, anybody else here got a view on what matters to their organization, what the crown jewels are? Cool. <laughs> we like to think we do. OK, cool. All right. So um, there's a, that, this is the problem space that I inhabit. Um, I go into organizations and I help them work out what actually matters, what the threats look like, and in order to do that, I use MITRE's attack. So, moved on. There we go. So, yeah, so I think we've all agreed over the course of the last two days attack's awesome. It's brilliant for expressing the generic, the, the attack that affects every organization, the Windows, the Linux, the Active Directory, the Exchange, etc. But oftentimes, by the time I get to the customer, they kind of go, well, actually, we've got something quite important, quite specific to our organization, quite specific to our industry, and we really don't know what that looks like. And yeah, it could be something as interesting as a payment platform, a payment platform that maybe allows you to transfer money internationally, could be something like an MPLS network or a software-defined network. Um, yeah, they're a service provider. Guess what? If the, if, the, if the carrier network goes down, they're in a whole heap of trouble and so are all of their customers. So these are the, yeah, these are the things I talk about when I talk about the crown jewels, uh, the keeping the lights on. I say so my job is to sit there, work with the customer, and build out that threat model. And I'm going to go through a little bit of what we've been doing, um, some use cases that we've come up that are quite specific. Um, and, and hopefully give a bit more light on how you might do this within your own organization when you go back to work on Monday or, or Friday if you're going back to work earlier this week. So anyway, so why, why can I talk about this? So my background, um, my very first SOC that I helped build uh, was almost 20 years ago, financial services. Uh, those were the days before um, Seams, before EDR, before um, DevSecOps, so we were cooking up all of this stuff from scratch. Retrospectively, I wish I'd known that these were what these things were called, because it would have been super helpful to have been the person that coined the terms. Great from a brand, from a branding perspective. But yeah, so us, our, our SOC um, at the bank ran on SQL Server. All of our events went into SQL Server. We ran nightly queries with SQL to go hunting. So yeah, not dissimilar from what we do now, just in a slightly less um, customized, tailored form. So anyway, yeah, so that, that's my background. I started there. I spent 15 years doing kind of reddish activities of varying different flavors for interesting UK customers, um, government, private sector, but always the ones that, yeah, had the money and had the challenges that they, that they really needed to solve. So that's, yeah, that, that's why I think I'm capable of talking about. I'm now back at Cisco. I'm doing the same thing as I was 20 years ago helping customers build their SOC capability uh, and answering the question, well, actually, you know, that system over there, this is what you need to worry about. So protecting the typical network, um, this is taken from the perspective of a vendor, a carrier, somebody who's responsible for a global infrastructure of some description, and they want to protect it, and it's theirs to, theirs to do as they see fit. So. That's a publicly available threat model. 
that we built for um, an organization called MEF, which is essentially a standards group for carriers and um, carrier vendors, um, to describe how SD-WAN might be attacked. Now, those of you that have come across threat modeling, and I'm going to ask another question at this stage, who here has done threat modeling of some description in the past? Cool. So there's more people who have done threat modeling than understand their crown jewels. That's interesting. Okay, so for those of you who have done threat modeling before, um, that threat model was produced with Microsoft threat modeling tool. So it's very developer-centric. Um, so it uses a framework called Stride, um, Microsoft's own framework for doing, for doing threat modeling. But on there, you can kind of see the moving parts. So it's a good place to start, right? If you're in an organization and you want to start to think about the assets that matter, Microsoft Tools probably as good a place to start as any. And on this diagram, we can see all of the constituent parts of, of a global network, um, from the client through to the business systems they're accessing. We can see some of those perimeters. We can start to look at what flows go across them, and we can start to think about, well, actually, yeah, what kinds of threats might exist in there? Moving a step along, uh, Microsoft's threat modeling tool does a really nice job of enumerating all of the th artifacts that you've pushed in and, and outlining what kinds of threats might exist against them. So again, a really useful place to start if you've not done this kind of thing before. It's a catalog. Um, but it's not a catalog that's lined to attack. So one of the challenges that I have is how do you translate something like a software development lifecycle threat model into operational terms? And you look at the numbers there. That threat model was produced between multiple vendors and multiple service providers. So it's a reasonably, valid, reasonably well validated threat model. But guess what? Even within the standards, we know that 94 out of 113 things, we can't possibly, as a vendor, tackle in isolation. We need to understand the implementation. We need to understand the operation. We need to understand the use case. So that's where, for me, attack plays a huge part. Because I'm no longer thinking about SQL injection and input validation, which would be nice to be thinking about, but isn't really going to help the average SOC analyst, isn't necessarily going to help the average detection engineer. So let's look at some more specific examples of kind of how you jump from theoretical software development um, threat to, to practical threat that we might talk about here. In fact, at least a number of these threats are things we've already heard from other speakers on over the course of this week. Um, and it's really nice, isn't it, that we can share that language. And I can immediately go, the previous talk was talking about things that I understand, and we called them this thing, and therefore we're all talking the same language. So yeah, let's, let's take a specific example. So knowing your customer, any ideas what this might be a representation of? No, no, I, okay, right, so let's take it on a step four. Um, so this was one we discovered during an incident. So I occasionally get involved in this response. Uh, we, we were called into a customer who had a leisure platform that processed money. Uh, perhaps you might be able to guess what kind of platform that might be, uh, but they were suffering from a credential stuffing attack. Curiously, at that point, I'd never heard the term credential stuffing. Um, an IR colleague was like, this is credential stuffing. I'm like, no, this is brute forcing. Um, and we started to map out where about it actually landed. And we kind of went, well, actually, it's valid accounts. Uh, it is an example of credential stuffing. And I learned a little bit more um, in, in the process of the investigation. But yeah, so the customer called in the incident response team and said, we're having this problem. Um, can you help? Ironically, I'd done the software architecture part of the platform that was being built. And I specifically, from a development perspective, said, this is something you're going to need to worry about. And they'd said, oh, well, it will put it on the backlog, as developers sometimes do. So anyway, so something I'd predicted could be a problem from a software development perspective became an operational problem. Um, and we started to dig into it. We did some threat intelligence gathering. We identified the tools and configurations. And we're like, OK, so now I'm sitting in the detection engineering and response space. How do I help the customer get better from this? 
it was credential stuffing, but it was lots of different IP addresses that didn't appear to be a particularly good pattern with regards to um, the user agent. Um, sure, we could just shut the site down, or we could kind of pursue law enforcement or things like that. We wanted something that was actually going to work in, in practice and quickly, because crown jewels. This particular platform, guess what? If they didn't have people logging in and putting money in and taking money out, they weren't making very much uh, making very much business. And actually, they want to pay their staff. Um, they want they want to be able to support the endeavors that they that they're committed to, the contracts that they signed up, etc. So, what did we do? So, we looking at the XE, we started to reverse engineer it. It didn't get very far because we didn't actually need to. We had the, the XE, we unpacked it, OpenSSL was sitting in there. Interesting, what version of OpenSSL was it? It's an old release. So we kind of went, okay, so can we do anything with the ciphers? The ciphers might be our way of, of locking out the attacker. Doesn't matter what IP address they come from, we can block them because we can detect them by the, by the cipher exchange. And guess what, well, that's where we ended up. Um, we looked at the size of the cipher suite selection that was being made, realized that it was a fairly unique number by comparison with some of the other um, customers to the site, looked at the ciphers that were actually being invoked inside the XE, and we're like, yeah, this, this will work. And so we built a detection. Um, we configured the F5s with some eye rules, and we blocked out the, the bad guys. Why do I say know your customers? Because guess what? Every single one of you could do that tomorrow. You could go to your web server. You could say, log my TLS exchanges. Log the ciphers that are being requested. And then you could go, actually, this subset of ciphers comes from this particular country or comes from this particular service provider. We don't do any work with them. Why are we servicing traffic to them? Um, or you could say, well, actually, we've figured out that you're using an old browser because the version of the ciphers that you're asking for. Um, and you could present a page that essentially says to your customer, hey, you should probably upgrade your browser. Um, so there are things you can do if you understand your application, you understand how it works and how, and, and, and how the, the user interoperates with it. So the next example, um, this one ties very nicely into the work that Kat's been doing. Um, Preparing for black hat. Any ideas what this might be? So this one's AD on Linux. Uh, so Contesso, for those of you that don't know, is Microsoft's name for their fictional company that they use to demonstrate all of their products. Um, the page at the bottom is a representation of the ETC password file. But this was a piece of research that I did in 2018, looking at how you attack AD joined Linux systems. Um, and as it says there, we ended up presenting a really nice, interesting talk. Um, this was driven by sitting on a customer site and realizing that everyone in their organization that was running Linux platforms had, a, had the integration in place. They were, they were tied back into AD, single authentication, really good, but also an, an, a novel attack surface that they've not really ever considered. You, you'd be hard pushed to ask a SOC engineer um, and not get a response along these lines if you talked about Windows. But the average SOC engineer probably wouldn't think, actually, our Linux systems are AD joined, are the same attacks possible? And guess what? Yeah, they are. In fact, in many cases, substantially easier. Um, OS credentials, SQL-like database in one case, um, granted only available to the root user. But you know, if you look at modern Windows and all the things they do to try and stop you messing with LSAS and the SAM file, quite substantially easier. Uh, and Kerberos tickets, just files under slash temp. Again, file permissions will protect you, but not a huge amount more. So for this piece of research, I was wearing my offensive hat. And I wrote Linux Hats, which is a tool that essentially allows you to enumerate all of these. Guess what? It's very similar to Mimic Hats, but just for, for Linux. Um, how would you defend against it? So this is, this is what I ended up building for Black Hat, because I was like, I'm not really sure I want to present the offensive tool without giving defenders some opportunity to, to protect. And so we, yeah, we, we went and looked at the, the syscalls that were underlying our operations. Um, I'm not a huge fan of file hashes, really not. And on Linux, even less so. Um, I like auditing. 
I like logs and I like logs at the lowest level possible because let's be entirely honest, everything that's further up the stack is far easier to tamper with. So yeah, we went and looked at the syscalls that Linux Cats was triggering. We picked out the interesting files that it might want to access. Um, and we built some audit D rules for this one. Um, looked at the constants, looked at the parameters that were going through the syscalls and were able to identify that, for example, even a generic connect string actually looked different from a Linux Cats perspective versus everything else, because it was a Unix socket. Um, and you could detect that based on the length of the string. Am I getting, am I, yeah. am I running out of time? <laughs> Damn it! Yeah, you're, you're over. Jet lag, we can blame jet lag. Ah, we've got one more. We've got time for one more? Fortunately not. Ah. Thank you so much, and happy belated birthday, by the way. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, baby. Um, I'm done. <laughs>